Hey, it worked. Hello. We How's it going? Are you all right? <coughs> yeah, right. sorry. How are you? Facebook was being a bit of a douche. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Look, we've got John, we've got David, uh, Katrina, Tommy, tons of people today. How's it going? All, all the best people. All the best people. All my favourite people. Oh, yeah. Did They're not you... bad. Not bad. Did you evening, John? Uh, did you grab a whiskey? I have. Mm. Have you already? Oh, okay. I, I just got on just forgot where the camera was then. Like, Way! <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, well, technically, it's not whiskey, as I was informed by a uh, rather pretentious bartender the other day. Uh, yeah. It's Jack Daniel's honey, so it's technically a sour mash. Ma- it sounds whiskeyish to me, Jack Daniel's. Mm, it's it looks so good, good, though. It looks like Coca Cola. It's got Coca Cola with it. Did you get oh, your okay. your drinking of preference? Tea. Went for a tea today. <coughs> oh man, hardcore tea today. Run day. Yeah. Alexandra, hey, hey, Joshua, <laughs> Joshua's driving, so I won't be able to comment. Yeah, don't <laughs> don't <laughs> comment. Uh, good Just to have you, crash. but I, know, I like the dedication. Yeah, but don't please don't crash. <laughs> nice. That's Look what I've got. Evening. Oh, the original. Yeah. Have you got the I... new cover? Oh. Okay. Look at the evolution. I also, um, yeah, I'm not so much. I might actually drop it into the, the comments in a minute. I actually found the original artwork that we were going to go for with the cover. Yeah. Um, yeah David. Hey, I David. How's it going, man? Good to have you. Hope the songwriting is going well. <laughs> um, yeah, man, you had a good day. It's been wonderful. It's been quite chill. It's been nice. Done some writing. Done some uh, taking my boy to gymnastics, which is always always fun. How about yourself? It's, yeah, good. Uh, I think last night uh, the pollen nation like launched a nuclear attack on my face, <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm dealing with the aftermath, like the fallout of the yeah. uh, hay fever. Um, Damn. Are you uh, are you happy with me dropping the original cover into the comments box right now? Yeah, sure. I don't really remember what what that was anymore. It's a long time ago. It, it was the one that we weren't we ended up not going with because um, do you remember that picture that we picked that we then found oh on yeah of course yeah I remember now yeah okay yeah uh, but it doesn't look like I can actually drop a picture in this yet I'll upload it onto Facebook afterwards okay cool yeah that's cool. but yeah the rot right. how um I'd say to people how did how did they find it but then give people a possible chance to, to comment below. yeah. John, John, yours is a collector's edition now. There isn't that many of the older covers out. So if you've got this one, then cool. this is... Uh, I think it's pretty much priceless yeah. these days now. Uh, I think, I yeah, mean, you could probably sell this for, I don't know, like a, a couple of mobile homes. Yeah, yeah. At least at least Get two. out on the road. Yeah. Yeah, least, yeah Joshua. Fuck Palin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fuck nature. Yeah. It's mm. bad that we can't, cool. can't survive if, with grass. Why am I allergic to grass? No. Christian Schultz nice. says, hey, man, how's it going? Uh, okay, so th- I've got to say, this. Uh, we normally do the book clubs. It's normally uh, different books that, that we haven't written. This isn't a sort of... <laughs> I've always, I felt a bit weird. I know I understood, and I understood that people might want to read these books, but it's still something that mm. feels a little bit strange to me that, that people have been reading... People I've been enjoying the books with are suddenly reading stuff that I've read, if that makes sense. It feels a bit strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was never meant to be a, a self-promo book club, but it was no. quite, quite nice that people wanted to put this one forward, so... Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so the, the original cover that Dan is going to put in the comments, we were pretty much sold on it. We were like, this is awesome. It's got, like, crazy-looking zombie things on the cover with crazy <laughs> yellow eyes. They're super creepy. And then... We saw like on like a poster for a club night in Dan's hometown, like a student club night, <laughs> that exact same image. And we were like, how is that? See if I can actually... Ended up there. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There it is. It looks pretty badass, I think. Still, it looks pretty badass, but... I still like it, yeah, yeah. But obviously, if it's on the like a, a nightclub cover in your hometown, you've got to mix it up yeah. a bit. Yeah. And then I'm pretty sure I saw it in about three or four other zombie books that were being released, and I was like, yeah, we can't. Yeah, because I think it was just a shutter stuck image. It was just it was just one that we found that was just, seemed perfect for the actual book, but then yeah, it's perfect yeah. for every book. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So Daniel, we wrote this book 
two years ago, ish, two and a half years ago. Uh, it was released February 2017. So we started. We started writing, writing it. it on the, the June before June? that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yep. In our so, little experiment that we did, where we each took the lead on a, a book each, and then swapped backwards and forwards with edits and, and produced sort of double double the work at, at once. But um, I do think. I think just because this was the first one, this will always be like one of the favourites of, of mine. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the first time I've co-written anything. Mm. Um, where the prose is sort of... Do you feel like you can see the bits that you've written and the bits that I've written in here? I know there's like certain lines that I remember <laughs> writing, but uh, I feel like it's been a, it was a pretty good mind meld. Yeah, I think, I think so. I don't... I... Uh... Because I've been asked this a couple of times, sort of when it comes down to how how do you guys write together, and it it reads just fairly smoothly. And, and to be honest, I think I think we've got quite similar writing styles. Um, I think there is <laughs> what we both found was there were certain phrases one of us would use a lot. Um, uh, I got I can't remember what yours was. I remember you you told me after sort of one of my drafts of a book that I I tend to say that people wink a lot. Yeah, fr- throw a wink. You had a it's a, quite a few throw people a wink. Like, Throwing winks. <laughs> yeah. And what was your one? I think it was. Uh, it was like just a throwaway phrase, like "and all that" or something at the end of the sentence. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, that does sound like love, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but no, I think I think it, uh, I, I if I read through it back now, I can't really tell the bits that I did and the bits that you did because I think we we were both quite heavy when we went through the edits um, just to make it the way that we wanted to, and I think, like I say, our styles were quite similar anyway, so it just worked relatively yeah. well. There are a couple of lines where I read through it and I'm like, yeah, that was a me line. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was same. Uh, I yeah. 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 But I think it's sort of just the right amount to to blend it together. But where did the... Uh, do you remember where the idea for The Rock came from? Because well, yeah, it was nothing like what it ended up being. Uh, so we were... The idea was that we were going to co-write a book each at the same time. So the idea was that I'd come up with an idea for a story, you come up with an idea for a story, and then we'd swap... Uh, and then we'd we'd write like the outlines for the books, and we'd swap again. We'd write the first drafts and swap again to do the second drafts, and, and keep swapping back and forth. Uh, so the other book that that came out of that was Lazarus, the one you're holding there now. Um, and then they were. I, f- I think I knew he wanted to do something post-apocalyptic because sort of very interesting, sort of trying that genre out. Um, and I'd watch. It, I was a big fan of the film The Fig. It's one of my favourite horror movies. Um, <laughs> I think the creatures in that, or the creature, the thing, and that is utterly terrifying, the way it sort of remolds flesh and, and, and bends it against its will and sort of constantly changes and creates teeth out of nothing and creates limbs out of nothing. It's such a scary concept. Um, so I thought, let's do some of the sort of post-apocalyptic uh, styles, a man and a dog story in a post-apocalyptic world. Instead of in England, in the sort of the world we know, um, and then instead of using zombies, which was sort of, I was kind of bored of zombies, the standard zombies ages ago. Uh, so I wanted to do something slightly different. And because I was watching the thing, I was like, let's see what that looks like together in that, in that m- melting part. And, uh, it just sort of came out this way. I mean, yeah. I mean, do you remember much about when we first came up with it? Well, do you remember the original, original concept? Not really. No. <laughs> it was a uh, so it was Dead Space meets The Last of Us. Um, that sounds we about that sounds right, yeah. it was Originally going to be set, I'm sure it was meant to be set in space, and we were talking about a space engineer having to go and fix something sort of on the other side of the planet that was affecting um, yeah. the people within his village. And then very very slowly, I think, like you say, those ideas uh, we started to actually do research and look at the different type of zombies we wanted to do. Um, the different kind of characters and i know that you were very keen on sort of that that thing influence as well which is a lot of where colin bolton came from um yeah and we kind of just then abandoned space i think because lazarus was looking to be a lot more heavy sci-fi yeah we then made this a lot more sort of post-apocalyptic and zombie but yeah. i think a lot of it was just sort of organic thoughts we went through but yeah the, the original i remember it being a space engineer going out and I don't, re- I, don't re- <laughs> I don't remember that. I remember <laughs> picturing McCready uh, from the thing, um, uh, Kurt, Kurt Russell with like long hair and a beard, 
with a with a dog, uh, and like an English sort of countryside. And I thought, yeah, okay, that's 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 a good starting point. Um, yeah, yeah. And then th- this is how it came out. I mean, I really wanted to have a dog in the story, um, <laughs> because sort of grew up around dogs. We've always had dogs, mm. and uh, I it's mean, just a good but, companion for books as well. Yeah, yeah. People love animals, but not in this book. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we're going uh, to go, go, yeah, we're gonna have to talk about spoilers in this in this podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do think if people uh, got a little bit upset by that part of the book, that wasn't <laughs> me who wrote that bit. <laughs> I, I know. I remember getting that draft back and thinking, oh, bloody hell. That's quite harsh. Four weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so but tough. I would say, uh, if you... If you we're a bit heartbroken by that. Read the second book because um, it, we sort of bring it back or we sort of bridge that gap in a little way. Yeah. And I'll tell yeah. you, the, I, can I give a little bit of justification for that? Uh, yeah. For that scene. So we obviously had Colin. Uh, he's already gone through a lot of his stuff with his family. He's been propelled forward. He's building a new life. Um, and after everything happens with the Lestrade and the farm, the farm and he's going through, it was very much... We were in that situation, or as we were going through the edits, um, I was very much in a situation where I saw that uh, Colin obviously had to kind of really make that decision between what is his new life, what is his old life, and what is going to be the crunch that then propels him forward and yeah. um, basically just makes him go absolutely mental on Stephen and, and just realise that he actually needs people to be there. Because I think the, the partnership with Week was always quite... It was a reluctant partnership in a way. He was kind of like... He didn't yeah. really want to love anything, did he? He was just, he was just a miserable bastard, is Colin. Um, but then realizing in that moment that he, he does actually love his dog care, yeah, and he has he has feelings. Uh, it just kind of propelled him forward into um, finding the other guys at the end. And yeah. I will be honest that <laughs> that episode, that uh, scene itself, I'd not long since watched the Mountain versus the Viper in Game of Thrones. <laughs> okay, um, which right. might have influenced some of the actual brutality in there, but. Uh, yeah, I think if, I if it doesn't quite go it, as it doesn't quite go as, as as far as that episode. That the Mountain vs. Viper episode of Game of Thrones uh, is one of the most shocking things I've ever seen on TV. Yeah. Uh, it's good though; so, it's good for what it is. So brutal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, Ka- sorry, go on, man. No, go on. I was going to say, Kathy sent in some questions. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to have a little work through. Yeah, let's good. Let's do it. Well, actually, the first question if is... If anyone's got... I was just going to say, if anyone's got any other questions as well, just pop them into the, the comments and we're happy to... Yeah. Josh, you're not meant to be typing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Kathy's first question was, what inspired you to write about the undead zombies in a whole new way? Breaking away from the typical George Romero version of flesh-eating, shuffling, can only be killed if shot in the head version copied by uh, nearly every horror writer. Um, again, I think we just, we've kind of talked about it. It's... We just didn't want it to see something different. And Dead Space, I do remember talking about Dead Space now, actually. Dead Space, the creatures from that, and I remember the thing, they sort of came together in this, in this sort of new idea. Um, I, would say it's, I would say it's kind of new. I mean, obviously, it's been done in various ways before, but we just thought, let's instead of having zombies, let's use this other sort of spin on that Um uh, we, we just need to keep. We need to keep it fresh for ourselves more than anything. We need to be excited yeah, by I, the idea ourselves. Yeah, and I think um, because it is, it's the cordyceps um, fungus concept. And to be honest, for me, that's one of the the most haunting actual sort of fungus out there that can actually create real zombies with with bugs and things. And if you actually do research and look into those, and and like I say, the the Last of Us use it really really well in um, in their game, but. I, no, I think absolutely like you say, the, the traditional zombie model, for me, I've never really been that much of a fan of, but to have these creatures that, it, it's a sort of, I, I really enjoyed the part where you sort of writing about the tendrils coming out and sort of attaching to other people. And it's almost that fear factor of they're physically going to touch you and find a way to yeah, yeah. manipulate what you're doing. And because it's grounded in actual, <laughs> actual science, um, it means it just adds that extra element and just makes it a bit more sort of realistic to the story. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, okay, Cappy's second question. In the book, the undead are nearly eradicated. 
Do you think that it's the most likely outcome in a post-apocalyptic undead world? Would it result from organisation of the uninflected, which means uninfected, uh, in combat to destroy the undead? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I don't. Per, I'm personally of the opinion that uh, there's nothing more disorganised than an organisation, and I I couldn't see if something like this were to actually strike uh, in a populated city like London especially, because I think we had it as Guy's Hospital in London, which would be the uh, original point where it sort of it all stems from. Around there, right? Yeah. Um, Eight million people in that sort of close proximity. I can't imagine anyone... So we, t- we talk about it later in the other books where there's a, they try to quarantine London, um, but the, the way this sort of the disease sort of spread as well, I just don't see anything surviving that I don't think I don't really think any sort of government response would be tactile or strong enough or have enough resources to sort of hold it back um, yeah and, and then uh, obviously once London has fallen um, it's just sort of going to filter out from that I mean the people of Fervis are always going to survive obviously but yeah that's that's sort of how I I don't think we I don't think we last long at all <laughs> What about you? No. No, I think, um, well, I mean, part of that space and time for us was sort of deliberately a little bit of a mystery to even ourselves because um, it's sort of eight years after the whole event of The Rock happened. And then as we start yeah. the book, The Rock is kind of a whisper in the wind. It's, it seems to have died down. And I think that's probably the scariest thing is people starting to have that hope that suddenly the world's free again and suddenly it all starts to rise up. Um, yeah, yeah. The the military organisations, I don't see them having any sort of control at all. And it's sort of it's. I think the dangerous thing is people who think they have control when really they have none at all. Um, see, I'm just rereading the question. Do you think it's most likely the outcome in a post-apocalyptic dead world? Yeah, I I think the way that I see it is that the undead would go through waves. So you would have the sinks where a lot of the population are hiding or that or they are dead. I think we, we put on the blurb itself about ninety percent of the actual population are dead. So what is there yeah. to remain for the undead to feed on? And then there is this sort of again, spoiler, um, resurgence of the rock coming back and I think that's kind of what is quite nice in the story. Is that rise and fall? Yeah, yeah. I mean it kinda of reminds me of um like the cholera outbreak in London and the Black Plague. Cholera outbreak started because the water was contaminated, and nobody knew that. Um, and it was only until they realised where the source of the infection was coming from. John Snow uh, in Soho found the the pump where the cholera was coming from. Um, they were able to turn it off and sort of halt the outbreak. Uh, this we haven't gone into the details yet as to what causes the outbreak. So I don't think until they knew the source of it um, how they were going to combat it and and sort of halt it. So I don't think our humans in this instance had any sort of any hope of surviving this event. Mm. Um, yeah, I think we even see the uh, the military in one of the scenes where it does a flashback yeah. to um, Colin's escape from London and, and the fear itself within the, the military organisations. They'd much rather kill anyone that's trying to escape than try and yeah, save yeah. their lives honestly and if that's the way people are going to be, because fear will drive them to try in any means necessary to stop an outbreak. Yeah. Is that the best way to do it? Or are they creating more ammo for the fire? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, number three, it would seem most efficient in fighting to eradicate the dead would be a coordinated effort. What do you think this would create the breakdown? What do you think would create the breakdown of society once that effort nearly eradicating the undead was accomplished? Our finger pointing and lack of trust, do you think today's society is already struggling with that issue? <laughs> finger pointing and lack of trust um, it's weird actually because one of the reasons why I kind of wanted to sort of start exploring um, post-apocalyptic fiction was because I've always sort of had this weird idea that everything was heading towards utopia Just I thought we'd have stumbles and we'd sort of fall on the way but we, I always had a really positive outlook that eventually we would be heading towards um, fully automated everyone has sort of their life completely sort of paid for and it's all going to be beautiful green flowers, uh, grass and self-driving cars and, uh, you know, every, everything's going to be like a utopia. But then, like, 
as I've gotten older, I've realised that that's probably not going to be the case. I, I don't think we're ever going to get to a <laughs> utopia. I don't think it's in our nature to, to get to that point. Uh, so then I started to sort of, in my haze of realising the world isn't perfect, sort of to sort of wonder about, okay, what would be the other side of it? What if things would go wrong? What I mean, we, with the Breakdown Society, that's kind of what, our, our gangs in, in in our books go sort of tribal. They sort of mm. become tribalistic, and I think I think that's the way it would go. It would become us versus them. It doesn't matter who us and them are. There's always that us versus them mentality. Mm. Red versus blue. Yeah. It's, it's the way we it's the way we're built. You need to have someone to go against, otherwise you're not what yeah. you're living for. But I also think coming back to sort of um, tribal comment as well, and for one of the attractions of post-apocalypse for me is that it's that whole fresh page resetting the slate starting from a new kind of yeah. um, romanticism there's that thing where we're so cluttered today in, in day to day lives with digital technologies with sort of friends left right center with job with mortgages with everything else on top of what life is to then have a big red button that you press and suddenly your biggest worry is literally where do i get my food from yeah there's something i don't know there's something quite liberating about that and i think in in a way that could be its own utopia itself is just not really having anything to worry about but yeah, yeah what life really is because i think we get massively deep into this chat but i think we uh we do sort of undervalue a lot of the stuff that sort of just keeps us alive and breathing and then overvalue the stuff that if it was gone tomorrow we'd be fine without those bits are quite nice to write you know in there at the start of the book before the, the craziness starts to happen Colin mm. and we are doing a routine walk around and it's just quiet and empty. Uh, it's quite nice to write because it, it does feel like back to basics lifestyle and it is quite nice and pleasant and there isn't the worry about council tax and um, <laughs> direct debits and everything. The car's breaking Getting down. home because my phone's run out of battery. Yeah. Um, mm. It does seem like a back, back to basics lifestyle that I actually think it would be quite nice in some ways. But, yeah. Uh... Okay. Yeah, I think uh, um, just, to, yeah. just to add a little bit more to, to Kathy's question, what do you think would create the breakdown of society once the effort nearly eradicating the undead was accomplished? Yeah, I think, like you say, the lack of trust, um, people not knowing who the right leader is because after the rot hits and the world is fragmented, you, it, it, again, it's going back hundreds and hundreds of years sort of regressing in, in human nature so it's like who then takes up that mantle to then lead the rest of the people out there when everyone doesn't is is so willing to yeah. kill each other over fear yeah by the way i was gonna ask if you since you started writing post-apocalyptic books have you uh, made a book out of bag have you prepped <laughs> just for the end in any way have i yeah have you like because I know a lot of people who write post-apocalyptic fiction. They they start to uh, they make a bag just get in case they keep. <laughs> yeah, they get the anti-radiation yeah. tablets and their um, <laughs> they stockpile water and stuff like that. I haven't. Have you? Okay. No, I was thinking of getting a bug out bag, mainly just to um, to sort of not not actually prepare for the end, but just to get <laughs> into the mindset of what you would need to survive something like that and. Uh, we did go through websites of uh, yeah. sort of end of the worlders just to see what they've got packed. The thing is, I know that knowing my luck, I'd have the bag in like the bottom of my wardrobe, and then I'd yeah. be at my nan's house or something when it all happened, and I wouldn't be able to get back. But your nan would survive. Oh wait, no, <laughs> my nan would. Survive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. I could just use my nan. So uh, uh, move on. <laughs> her next question is: uh, In the rock, you portray the real monsters as the scavengers. Those who those who survived by taking what others have worked hard for, crushing the hope of sustainability by raiding, killing, leaving nothing. Was this your social statement on our world as it is today? There is a fine line between being a drain on a resource of a society versus living cooperatively and giving back for what you take, focusing on the greater good. Versus, oh, okay, yeah. So uh, she's saying, uh, were we thinking about people who work for themselves and they take it, or people who work collectively? Um, what is the moral good? Yeah, well, I think um, 
I think we are in this book the the uh, the theory or at least the working sort of statement is it's better to to open your yourselves and work with other people. So at the start of the book, Colin is a lone wolf. He, he lives with this other family, but he's not really part of that family. Um, he's he's very sort of insular after losing his um, wife and child at the start of the book. Um, and as we sort of build it towards the end of the book, he becomes to realise that he will need other people and he can offer people him, you know, his services and his sort of skills as a survivor. Uh, so we're we're pushing towards that idea that like in our own little publishing company, we always, our whole theory is a rising tide raises all ships. We do believe that um, it's a much better, much more fun, and just it's an easier way of life if you if you don't live alone and you sort of offer yourself to other people and, you know, take stuff in return. And um, I think we both believe that's the better way, don't we? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't think yeah. it was um, any particular statement on society. I think it was probably just yeah. a reflection of of us and the sort of the lens that we see life through more than anything else. Not saying that it's right or wrong in one way or another, um, because the the scavengers can easily have sort of if we did a story through their lens, they could easily sort of flip the table and have it the other way around. Um, but the the fact is, they kind of they they've become a lot more tribal. They found a more barbaric way to to survive and because of that people fear them whether that fear is justified or not but that that's just a method they use because they're not they're not all bad in that there's still a community there they all they all work together to become yeah. scavengers and do what they want to do um, their value their values is slightly twisted on it because they're mostly referring to themselves as a family mm-hmm. they they place the family over everything else over the over other people yeah. over community surviving whereas um the Dutchmen and the people of hope sort of want to bridge communities and they want to build trade and that starts to get into a little bit more of that in book two. We introduce uh, Kings Hill, which is this other town uh, nearby. Uh, so, I mean... Wait till you meet the wisps in book three. Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> there's... Um, the, uh, the sort of the Traveller family. I mean, they are... I wouldn't say they're good. I mean, they're just very focused on keeping their family alive above all else. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a bad thing at all. Um, yeah, I think that answers that question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Last one from Kathy. Which character do you see yourself linked to the most? Gender, not an issue. Mm. Sorry, I just saw a Christian's comment for book three. It's coming. It's in progress. Yeah. yeah. Okay, which person do you see yourself related to the most? Um, I mean, you I know... know. <laughs> <laughs> I know who I, I feel like. Colin Bolton is the lens you? through which I saw the... No, no, well, it's the lens through which I saw the world as I was writing it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> he was the character I was yeah, yeah. relating to the most there. Mm. What about you? Um... I'm going to do myself a disservice here because I've completely forgotten her name. The <laughs> uh, I'm going to be able to find it now. This is awful. The woman who runs the show with the sword. What is her name? Are you talking about book two? No, book one. The black woman. So the one that's kind of like the leader in Denton Factory. Oh, okay, yeah. I can't remember her name either. It's been a long time. It's been a three years. It's been nearly three years. Oh, this is awful. Uh, I guess I keep finding it. But yeah, I think... Okay, yeah. Probably... probably. Oh, Rhea, there we go. There we go. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, Rhea. Um, I think probably Rhea because I like... Um, I just like her style and her kind of efforts to try and unite people and sort of take control as a leader to it's that kind of it's her battling that conflict of some people who don't quite want to listen to her some people that do and I feel like there's kind of like that bit of there's that sort of chaos in my life where it's like it's not just the easy ride but there's all these other pieces you have to pick 
pick up just in order to do the things that you need to do. Yeah, well, that, that's that's because your previous job, you were a sort of a leader of quite a few teams, and you were in that authority authoritative position, right? So I can see why yeah, that yeah, might yeah. ring true with mm. you. Yeah, it's yeah. constantly having to battle. You have the people who want your spot. You have the people who definitely want to listen. And it's just that kind of like yeah. battling of all the egos and trying to make stuff happen. And, and at the end of the day, you've got that one job that you need to deliver and do. And it's kind of doing that. Um, I just think she's quite funny and a bit of a hard ass as well. And I actually quite, <laughs> I, I quite like her arc and where she goes in book two as well. Yeah. Because I think yeah. uh, it's definitely an element of humanising her that was quite fun to do. Yeah, I quite like uh, uh, the Dutchman's progress as well through book two. So if people haven't read book two yet, it's, it's good. All the characters get, <laughs> you know, we further the story. They remain. Okay, so um, that's that's the rock. Hey, Andy. Thank you very much for very much reading. I do feel a little bit awkward. I don't know why. It's... Uh, <laughs> It's just why I have. <laughs> um, <laughs> you just know the first one. No, I think um, yeah, it's it's again flattering for, for people to wanted to both this wanted to read it. Um, the second book, in my opinion, is just as good as the first. Um, I will say that because obviously we wrote it. Um, but yeah, I think for people like Christian wondering where book number three is, we do have essentially the first outline ready um, to go. We just need to get some edits down, make the story a bit more solid. But what we'll do is um, likely for anyone on the bunker mailing list is once we've got sort of a secure date for when we're going to aim to get that one out, put it on there and sort of announce it to people. Um, so if people do want to find out more about these books and make sure that they don't miss out on anything, uh, any of the news that's coming up, um, then go to hawkandcleaver.com slash bunker and you can join our mailing list where you can then sign up and just get all the updates as they come. Yeah, that's good. Joshua says, I really, I really like Stephen, Stephen till he turned out to be a dick hole. He did I, I turn into a bit of a, a dick box. Yeah. <laughs> well, Josh messaged me, um, I don't know, probably about 30% of the way, no, probably about 50% of the way through the book. Just like, yeah. oh, this is really good. This, this, oh, I really like that Stephen guy. And in my head, I'm like, has he read that bit yet? And then he sent me a message afterwards, just going, no, Stephen. Like, yeah. So I'm glad that yeah. twist worked because uh, that took some crafting because. I think one of the hardest parts of writing storylines like that is obviously when you're writing it, you know what's going to happen. Yeah. So it's like, is the reader going to see this coming a mile off or is it going to be a surprise? But yeah, apparently yeah. it was a surprise, which is good. Good. Uh, next up, we are doing Stephen King's The Outsider. I'm welcome. Have you got it already? Yeah. Wow, okay. I've not, I happened right to yet. buy it about four weeks ago because it was £4 in Sainsbury's. Yeah, Dan said it was four pound fifty, and as there, I couldn't see it. Um, Look at that! Look at that as well. The pages. That's cool. I like that cover as well. Mm. It's quite cool. Yeah. The American cover is so much better, in my opinion. Was that the grey one? It's got the silhouette, yeah. like the red eye. Yeah, that's really why, cool. Why do they keep yeah. doing that with American books? Just giving them really good covers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do that with ours. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you again for for tuning in reading the book, joining the book club. Uh, we're going to The Outsider by Stephen King and that will be the, the halfway point of the year. Jeez. And I guess maybe maybe we should do a sort of a like a wrap-up and we can rate the books and we mm-hmm. can decide why they write as number one on the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> cool, man. Yeah, I don't know what else we can, we can talk about here. I mean, have you uh, got anything else you want to talk about? No, just thank you again. Um, I mean, if people do have any more questions or anything else, just feel free to pop them in the comments as well. Even if uh, you're not joining us live, we'll we'll jump in and, and put some stuff in there. But um, no, I'm about 15 pages into The Outsider. It stinks of Stephen King, which is good. Um, <laughs> smells like Stephen King. <laughs> smells yeah. like Stephen King, which is quite good. So uh, enjoying that so far. So that'll be hopefully quite a good one. Um, I did, probably worth mentioning as well, I did put on the comments for the folks that... I think for future book posts, what we'll probably do is do a Stephen King stuff separately as like a whole month of Stephen King every now and then. Because it seems yeah. to be no matter what we put on, the minute you throw in Stephen King, it's just to the top. 
I think that's the that's the way in, in everything. He's like he won um, Goodreads, the website Goodreads, where people talk about books a lot. And so um, he won the Goodreads awards for genres that he I wasn't even it. in. Mm. Like they were like comedy genres, genres that he had nothing, no place in being. But because he's Stephen King, ah, Stephen King, the famous comedy writer. <laughs> as soon as people see his name, it's like ah, I need to click on that name. <laughs> Which I yeah. understand, because Stephen yeah. King's a great, great actor writer, but. Yeah, we need mm-hmm. to separate him out a bit. Uh, I think yeah, we do like yeah. an all, all female author. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. We've got um, a list of of books put forward. So next month will be a an all female horror bookathon. Should be quite yeah. interesting. Cool, cool. Nice. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, 